Hey everyone, this is Nick, and while this weekly news video might be a day late, it is not a dollar short, because we have tons of Linux and open source stuff to cover. This time, Razer and Lambda Labs partner to offer us a Linux laptop with Linux pre-installed out of the box. We have DuckDuckGo revealing more details about their web browser, and Ubuntu 22.04 was released amongst a lot of other updates to GNOME, to KDE, to hardware from Star Labs, but also to Linux Gaming and Proton. Let's dive in, just like you should dive into this small browser extension that will help you stay private online. Thanks to Startpage for sponsoring this video. You might already have heard about Startpage as a search engine that uses Google results, but anonymizing them and removing every single point of data that Google could use to track you and your searches. But now they've launched a new extension called Startpage Privacy Protection. It's an extension for Chrome and Firefox, but you can also install it on any Chromium-based browser. What it does is simple. It will set your default search engine to Startpage, but you can still change that back if you prefer another private search engine. It will send do not track signals to all websites you visit. It will block any third-party tracking script, and it will replace all social media, video, and music site tracking with click to activate controls. On top of that, it will display a privacy rating for each site based on its behavior before everything was blocked. And it will also give you a complete privacy report to let you know what you blocked all throughout your browsing session. Oh, and if you're afraid that it's going to break some websites that you visit, you can tell the extension to let some cookies or some tracker scripts pass through the extension just so the website can work. If you want to try out that new extension, just follow the link in the description below. So KDE Gear 22.04 was released. The compilation of KDE software received a lot of changes, with Dolphin getting better compatibility with MTP devices and thumbnails for EPUB files. Console has a better SSH plugin that lets you map different color profiles to different SSH accounts. Kdenlive got support for M1 Max and its render dialog is now more legible. Ocular has a welcome screen and Calendar is now part of the whole software compilation. Smaller changes include better support for touch screens in the music player, Eliza. Spectacle, the screenshot tool, gets more annotation features. KDE Itinerary supports more train companies and airlines. And Gwenview can now guide you to import media from a camera. Kate is also faster and lets you differentiate files that have the same name but different locations. Big updates to the core KDE apps. I just wish these could be released at the same time as new KDE Plasma releases to make my job easier at the detriment of others. And the KDE developers never rest because there's another one of these nice weekly KDE blog posts. This time we have two 15 minute bugs that were fixed, including a nasty one that made Discover crash with specific flatpak remotes. The slide gesture on Wayland is also now one-to-one, -one, so you get more touchpad goodness. The night color slider now changes the color hue in real time, so you can actually see what it's going to do. And a ton of work went into LibreOffice to make it work better on KDE, including with interface scaling. And finally, desktop icons can now remember their position for each resolution. A ton of bugs were also fixed for the Wayland session and for various desktop components. Less screenshots and user visible improvements this time, but I still love that KDE takes the time to polish things up, to remove bugs, and make the experience just smoother and better for everyone. Not to be outdone, GNOME application developers are also hard at work. Fractal, the Matrix client, now has static location events support and can display some nice maps. Musai, the Shazam of the Linux desktop, has a new beautiful UI and uses libadvita. Furtherance, the time tracking tool, now displays the total time it tracked for the day, and it got German, Spanish, and Italian translations. Workbench, a sandbox to learn and prototype using GNOME technologies, now has demos and examples, and Fosh, the mobile GNOME shell, now has swipe gestures in the top and home bar to quickly navigate around. Callbird, a Twitter client, now uses libadvita and has an account system, and there's a new beautiful audio player for users who don't need full library management. It's called Amberall. Great work happening on the GNOME application scene. I think we're really starting to see the beginnings of the making of a real true app ecosystem there. 
Sousa Linux, a distro I definitely don't talk about enough, is developing what they call an adaptable Linux platform, or ALP for short. This ALP will be the successor to Sousa Linux Enterprise 15. They're going to split the distribution into a small hardware enabling part, a host OS, and a layer providing and supporting applications which will be container and VM based. It's not exactly clear to me what this will entail, but it seems like it's close to what Silverblue is doing. ALP will also be developed openly with the OpenSUSE build service, so everyone can look at it, contribute, and maybe also create their own stuff based on these modular components. We'll have to wait a bit to get more details about how this new thing is going to come together, but it's still super interesting to see Linux distros that have been here for a long time go back to the drawing board and try something new, especially when it's all open. Oracle, now the owner of Solaris, formerly owned by Sun, is making a new version of Solaris 11.4, which is freely available for non-production personal use and for open source developers. It's called Open Solaris CBE for Common Build Environment, and it's a rolling release. Users will be able to upgrade to paid releases if they so choose, and there's a license agreement to sign on top of an Oracle account being needed to download it. Oracle seems to hope that this new release will ease the integration of open source software that Solaris relies upon. I don't know if Solaris is relevant in any market whatsoever, so to me it seems like it's a little bit late to get the community involved in that, but I'm not in the know. In an amazing development, Razer teamed up with Lambda Labs to make the TensorBook, a laptop made for deep learning that runs Linux out of the box. It's a stunning device with a beautiful chassis, a nice white chiclet keyboard with purple accents, an RTX 3080 Max-Q, 64 gigabytes of RAM, an Intel Core i7 CPU, 2 terabytes of PCIe 4 storage, and a 165 Hz 1440p display at 15 inches. In terms of I.O., it has an SD card reader, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, three USB 3.2 ports, an HDMI port, and a headphone jack. It's not cheap, as the base model goes for $3,500 with Ubuntu 20.04, although I would expect them to update that to 22.04 soon. You also get the Lambda stack pre-installed, which contains all the latest drivers and tools for machine learning, like PyTorch, TensorFlow, CUDA, and more. I mean, I do not do anything machine learning or deep learning related, but I would still love to have that device as a daily driver. It sounds like a dream machine. Star Labs, a manufacturer of devices shipping with Linux out of the box, has a new small form factor desktop to complement their laptop lineup. The Star Labs Byte is a Ryzen-based system with an 8-core Ryzen 7 5800U, and it can get up to 2TB of SSD with extremely fast read and write speeds, as in all Star Labs devices, that's what they call an over-provisioned drive. It can go up to 64GB of DDR4 RAM, and it's got some nice I.O. with two HDMI ports, four USB-A ports, an Ethernet jack, a microSD slot, a USB-C port for power and expansion, a barrel charger, and an audio jack. It can be shipped with Core Boot, and you can open it without voiding the warranty, but it starts at 780 euros. I don't know if Star Labs designed the chassis this time as they do with all their laptops, but it looks like a powerful, tiny, and cute little device for just a simple desktop. I'm not sure about the price, though. Still on Star Labs, the Starbook, their really nice-looking Ultrabook, now has the option to use Ryzen CPUs. Previously, it was limited to Intel 11th Gen processors, but that oversight has now been fixed. Your only option is the Ryzen 7 5800U, same as what the Star Labs Byte will ship with and this will add 150 euros on top of the base price by replacing an i3 1115G4. Admittedly, the 5800U is clocked lower than the other option, the i7 1165G7, but it also makes up in terms of cores at 8 versus only 4 for the Intel i7. The rest of the laptop should be unchanged apart from the integrated GPU, which I would expect to be better on the AMD processor than on both Intel options. I personally would always go for an AMD CPU in a laptop instead of an Intel one because I generally tend to benefit from the higher core count, so it's really cool to see that option being available. 
Now I made a review of the Starbuck a while ago, I left a link in the card somewhere in one of these corners. DuckDuckGo gave more details about their incoming web browser designed for privacy. They actually released the Mac version with the Windows version coming soon. It comes with DuckDuckGo as the default search engine, of course. It has a tracker blocker, a new cookie pop-up blocker, a one-click button to delete all data, it has email protection and all by default without any configuration needed. It's also supposedly fast, building on Safari's web engine on Mac. They say they are faster than Chrome on Motion Mark and they use 60% less data. It also has all the features you might expect with tabs, bookmarks, password management and more. And what about Linux? Well, they said they would love to support us as well, but they're focusing on Mac and Windows first, which makes sense in terms of market share. I would love to give it a shot on Linux if it ever comes to our system, but they seriously need to not use the DuckDuckGo logo as a browser icon. I do not want that thing in my dock. Ubuntu 22.04 was released. The new LTS comes packed with updates and new features, the most prominent of which is accent colors, letting you pick from 10 different hues to tweak how your desktop looks. It of course still has dark mode and the light theme is now whiter all around, including in the GNOME shell. It comes with GNOME 42 and all its nice features like redesigned on-screen display elements, a better looking shell theme, updated applications and better performance. Ubuntu 22.04 also brings the kernel up to version 5.15 and the Mesa drivers to version 22. It will be supported until 2027 and will be the base for a lot of user-centric distributions, so it's kind of a big deal. All the usual Ubuntu flavors also got their updates. I already made a video review of Ubuntu 22.04 and all of its flavors, so check it out in the card up top if you haven't seen it already. You might be familiar with ProtonDB, the website that lets you check for various Steam games compatibility. Analyzing this data, Boiling Steam seemed to notice that the number of games marked as borked, as in they just won't work at all on Linux, has been decreasing rapidly. From almost 50% in 2018 to less than 20% in 2022. The real shift seemed to happen in October or November 2021, which also seems to coincide with the release of Proton 7, which solved a bunch of issues for a lot of titles. On the other hand, in terms of distros used for gaming, Ubuntu seems to be slowly losing relevance. Data from ProtonDB indicates that people who leave reviews for how well games work are less and less on Ubuntu and more and more on Arch or Manjaro. This is probably not a totally accurate depiction of the state of the market, but it's still interesting to look at. I just love to see these kind of trends. Well, on, on the number of games being bought going down, on the amount of people using Ubuntu or something else, I really don't care. People will use whatever they want to use. Another week, another milestone for the Steam Deck, which now reaches 2200 games marked as verified or playable. There are 1139 games that should run without issues, as long as the deck review team has improved a bit in terms of testing, and 1,071 playable titles, which will also run fine, but might have small issues with the controls of the deck or with elements being a bit small on screen. Some titles included this time are Eternal Radiance, Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, GTA San Andreas, The Lord of the Rings Online, Guilty Gear or Final Fantasy VI, which isn't the best Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy VII is the best Final Fantasy and probably should have been the last, the final Final Fantasy. I'll fight you on this. If you like to game on Linux, but you think that installing all the various compatibility tools, launchers, libraries, and other necessary stuff is too complex, there's a new project that might suit your needs, if you like Flatpak. The aptly named Gaming Flatpak is basically a script that will let you install tons of gaming-related software, including Steam, Lutris, the Heroic Launcher, Proton GE, various emulators, Minecraft, but also Discord, TeamSpeak, OBS, Caden Live, or Mango Hut. It's still mostly in French and English, and the project has just started, but it's already very easy to use. Just run the script, you get a nice window, you check what you want to install, hit OK, and it will automatically install all of that for you using Flatpak. It can even install Flatseal if you need to change permissions for a few of these applications. 
It's a great project, but it also highlights the difficulty for new users to actually find and use all the various little programs needed to actually play all their games on Linux. Proton also got a new update, version 7.0-2, and it's a big one. A ton of games are now playable with Proton, including Devil May Cry HD Collection, Dragon Quest Builders 2, A Way Out, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Elden Ring or Double Dragon Trilogy, amongst others. It also fixes a ton of bugs for games using the Unity engine, and a lot more games should now be able to play video files and cutscenes when using patent-protected video formats. Of course, it also updates DXVK, VKD3D Proton, and DXVK NV API, the implementation of the NVIDIA API for DXVK, so every game should perform at its best. As always, you can get that latest release directly from Steam. There is still a long way to go before we're able to play every single Windows game on Linux, if that ever happens, but the work that Valve, Wine and the community have done is astounding. If you had told me two or three years ago that we would be able to play two-thirds of Steam games on Linux, I would have laughed you off the room. And yet, here we are. And here's our sponsor, Slimbook. These guys are based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops, Linux desktops, Linux all-in-ones, Linux small form factor PCs, basically every single type of device that you might want with Linux pre-installed out of the box. They ship worldwide, they've got a huge range of keyboard layouts, and they've got devices for virtually every need and every price point, from their cheaper laptop, the Slimbook Essential, to their higher desktop tower, the Slimbook Chimera, which I use to run the channel and edit all my videos. If you need a new device with Linux pre-installed on it, check the link in the description below and click it and see what they have. I'm sure you'll find something that you need. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments as well. If you want to help support the channel, you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!